And I unmuted myself. I started the recording and I'm going to share my screen over here, share screen and uh, get into the presentation mode. And I'll say good evening to everybody. Welcome to meeting number 46, 46 weeks of ET Express Online, March 1st, the 1st of March. We've got a couple of great presentations. Uh, we've got a tag team today. We've got uh, Robert Fronfeld and Peter Bach are going to tell us about locomotive maintenance by request, by the way. Somebody, uh, we had a, early uh, in our series, we had a presentation on the same subject, but somebody said, let's please do it again in more depth. So we've got uh, some guys that can dive deep on this, what they can do in a half hour, that is. Um, and then Dale's going to take us uh, on, on the water here, the water features, again, by request. Somebody said, gee, I, I don't know how to do water on my layout. Can you, can you help? And Dale said, sure. So he's going to show us all the stuff on his layout that he has done, which is fantastic, as most of you know. So great presentations coming up uh, future weeks, painting buildings, uh, digital control with Arduino and Raspberry Pi for the techies. Gulliver's Gate, New York City, doesn't exist anymore, but it was kind of an interesting uh, knockoff, a miniature wonderland. We're going to talk, take a look at that. Uh, the Most of you have probably read some of the CNN stories and so on about the TEE revival. So uh, Bill Keeney is going to give, a, give us a little uh, tour of that, what that's all about, what's happening in the revival of the TEE. Trackside distance markers, we're going to be talking about those. You see another thing we've seen, but we don't focus on. And now every time you, after this presentation, every time you see a picture, you're going to be looking at the trackside distance markers. And then uh, we're going to go to the Dresden Steam Festival, for those of you who haven't been. So another uh, fun thing to do in Europe that uh, we don't get to do right now. So um, looking for presentations still on airbrushing, uh, modeling snow, we need somebody to do that before the snow melts, guys, back east, come on. And uh, control panels, little small local control panels. How do you build one of those? What's your, what's your technique? All right. And uh, as we said last time, we're going to have a special mystery guest presenter. Somebody guessed it would be the Pope. That's not true. Uh, there have been a couple of other guesses that have come in this evening. And uh, I won't have you hang in too much longer. What we're going to do is between the two presentations, we're actually going to announce who the presenter or mystery presenter is going to be for our anniversary edition. So stay tuned. It's not the Pope, is it? Oh, that's it's not Rod Stewart, is it? No, 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 none of those, Dave. All right, get off, Dave. God darn it. <laughs> Bursting in here. All righty. With that, I think we'll move on to uh, Robert, I guess, is going to take it, right? Okie dokie. Uh, I'll share my screen. Is that okay? Uh, let's see. I don't see it. Do you guys see that? Nope. We don't see it. Why would we want to see it? Go ahead and try again. Stretch had to stop sharing his. Okay. I'm gonna I'm gonna start <laughs> sharing mine. Okay. Tell me if tell me uh, if we're okay. Yep. Got it. Got it. There we Just go. Put it in presentation mode, and we're good. I'm I'm getting there. I'm getting there. All right. Awesome. Uh, uh, PowerPoint. Yep. Yeah. Okay. There we go. Okay, um, good evening, everybody. Uh, special welcome to my, my lovely wife and her son, Todd, who are joining us this evening. Um, this is gonna be a, a two-part presentation uh, shared by uh, myself and, and my friend, my good friend, Peter Bach. Uh, the first half is gonna be on, uh, on maintenance of uh, Markman locomotives, and then Peter's gonna pick up about halfway through, and uh, he's gonna go over uh, uh, diagnosing problems and uh, when you have a locomotive that doesn't run or if you have any issues. And so uh, we've got a lot of stuff to go through here. Uh, as you can see from the screen here, we've got tools and parts and all kinds of goodies to, to go over. And uh, I'll be trying to make it quick because I know there's a lot to cover here, but uh, I will make the presentation available to everybody. Uh, and uh, I'll, I'll share it with Stretch, or you can email me. I'll be happy to, to send you a copy. So without any further ado, let's go down to the next slide. Okay, we're going to cover the maintenance issues first, as I said. Uh, very briefly, we have uh, Markman uh, motors, different types of motors. We have uh, flat armatures and round armatures. Uh, not, not a whole lot to say about that. We'll get into uh, what the differences are uh, in, in a small way here shortly. Um, 
different types of uh, motors. These are the ones that have the wound field coils, as you'll notice here. It's uh, these are not these are not permanent magnet motors. These just have round wound field coils, but it really doesn't matter. Uh, they all every every motor has an armature, even if it has a permanent magnet uh, type of motor in it. The uh, very very brief anatomy of a of a of a Marklin motor. Uh, it has a. Uh, <clears throat> They have brushes, they either have round brushes. A lot of people uh, often ask me, well, what do I need to do? Or how do I tell what kind of motor I have? Uh, well, if it has a wound field coil, it can have both. It could have either a, uh, a round brushes with the, with the round armature, or it could have the rectangular brushes as shown down here with the, uh, uh, with the permanent magnet. But one has nothing to do with the other. You can have round round brushes with, a, with the wound field coil and, uh, these are the round, you have the, the um, carbon one and the little wound uh, rolled up piece of uh, copper mesh there. And right here, you can see where you would want to place oil. I get uh, so many people asking me uh, that my locomotive doesn't run or it squeaks or whatever. Uh, it's very important to know where to put the drop of oil. And when I say a drop, I mean a tiny drop. A little bit of oil goes an awful long way. Uh, before I get to the next screen, uh, you can see here each motor shield has a couple of screws. They're diagonal from each other. Okay, as you can see here and in the bottom drawing here as well, every motor shield of this type of motor, whether it's a wound field coil or a permanent magnet, they have two screws and you just loosen those two screws and the motor shield comes off. Robert, a Again. question. Yes. Is, uh, is removing the motor shield uh, a, a maintenance thing, would you say? Well, you know, oftentimes people, uh, and, I, and I'd be the first to admit, uh, the first time I had replaced brushes, I was a little bit nervous about it. Uh, I was at somebody's house one day and he pulled the locomotive off the tracks and he opened up the locomotive. He took the two screws out. He took the motor shield out uh, uh, off the brush plate off to change the brushes. And I said, what are you doing? And he said, well, I'm just changing the brushes. And I said, well, why are you taking it all apart? And the answer to that is, is it absolutely necessary? No, but it's kind of like, would you take your, uh, would you take your car to the, to the dealer and tell them to change the oil and not change the filter type of a deal? You'll, you'll notice if the brushes are worn down to the point where they need to be replaced, there's probably a little bit of dirt and gunk in there, built up uh, graphite from the brushes and uh, maybe some oil. And you always want to clear that out. So is it absolutely necessary? Of course not. Is it a good idea? Very much so, so. Robert, I, I have yes. two questions. How long can a locomotive run before you have to replace the brushes? And the other thing is I had an unfortunate experience. I, I run two conductor, but I think that the issues are similar. I run uh, Flashman and Rocco and Pico, but um, I had an unfortunate circumstance where I was working on a Pico uh, uh, Kerf locomotive and one of the little parts went flying off, never to be found again, <laughs> uh, which caused me untold difficulties to try to get a replacement part. So my two questions are, how long can you run a locomotive before you have to replace the brushes? And two, I'm afraid that when I open these things up, things will go flying or do they generally stay in place? Great questions. Uh, let's address the first one. How long can you go before you need to replace the brushes? Well, as long as you can still, you, you, take a look at the top photo here uh, or, or the bottom one for that matter. You'll see, you'll see how, how far extended out toward the, the face of the, um, of the motor shield these are. Okay, these are brand new brushes in here. So they're, they're pretty high up. As they wear down, of course, these little springs that you see up here and in the bottom, there are springs that go, uh, they're right here and here, they're a little hidden by the wires. They will push the brushes in toward the armature, of course, as they wear down. Uh, you can notice, you'll notice uh, pretty quickly uh, when they get to be uh, down towards the, I, I can't give you a measurement, but I would say once they get down to about halfway, it's a good idea to replace. It's a very inexpensive, um, uh, service part. Does, does the locomotive start to run rough or what happens? Well, it, 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 uh, no, actually, guys, 
excuse me a second. I think yeah. we're going to have to hold the questions. Uh, this is the forum really isn't is more of a presentation as opposed to a and A. I think that it will get all bogged down. We've got 147 people on. If everybody chimes in with questions, we we won't have an opportunity to get through the okay. presentation. Okay. Okay. Right. Sorry, Scott. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well. Okay. Well. Okay. Very good here. But these are the. This is the, this is the most critical part of of uh, make, keeping your locomotive running right. If it if it sounds if it's running rough if it's making any sound, this is the place where you oil it. A tiny drop of oil at the end. And and why and why is it important to do it here and and not as much as any other place? The answer is very simple. This is the one point where you have contact being made with something spinning around at its highest speed. If you've ever seen the inside of a, of a motor, which I'm gonna show you momentarily, you'll see that there are gears and the gears change change the, uh, the, the ratio, if you will, okay? This armature is spinning at the, is the, is the fastest moving part in the locomotive. And the inside there may be a, 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 the armature itself has seven or eight teeth. And then it's, it's hitting a gear that may have 14 teeth and then on the inside and maybe 30 teeth on the outside. So at that point, the, 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 the fastest that the wheels could possibly run, it might be a quarter or, or, or even less of the speed of, of, of the armature. The armature is what's moving the fastest and that's why you need the oil here. A tiny drop here on the side where you can see it, where the brushes are and on the reverse side of the locomotive of the motor, uh, there's a similar spot where you will see the armature poking through. Here's the inside, and you can see what I mean here by the gears. The armature, as I said, has about seven or eight teeth, and here you've got a reducing gear here. It's got probably twice as many teeth, and then on the outside part of it, it's got twice as many teeth again. So by the time it gets to actually driving the wheels, it, it may, it, it's probably only going, the wheels themselves are only going about a quarter of the speed of the armature. When I take a locomotive apart, and I clean it, you'll see the arrows here where I put the tiny, a tiny, tiny drop of oil. It's not on the teeth of the gear. You don't have to worry about the teeth of the gear. They'll take care of themselves just fine. But right here, this, it looks like it's <clears throat> brass colored here, right where it, it, it intersects. It, this, this gear is spinning around this circle here. That's where you want a tiny drop of oil. Same right here, same here. Anything that's actually, that you see spinning like an axle or, or a pin inside of something, that's where you want to put the oil. And you'll see where I've got it highlighted here, the different arrows. Up here is an oil wick. Many of the older Markman locomotives have a, a, a sponge, I call it a sponge or an oil wick on one or both sides, a drop or two. You can put a couple of drops of oil there if you want, but don't overdo it because a lot of people say, well, I put a, a drop of oil on there and it ran so much better. So I decided to put another drop on and it didn't do much good. So I put another drop on and before you know it, all of a sudden you've got yourself a mess. And <clears throat> it's, it's not so much that you've got oil going all over the place. The worst thing is you wind up getting oil inside the motor and it, it starts interacting with the, uh, the, 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 the microscopic uh, carbon par particles that are coming off the brushes and the oil and the, and the, and the, and the graphite uh, uh, dust, if you will, it starts, mixing together and becomes something that's like toothpaste. And we all know how toothpaste works. It's an abrasive. And that's what happens when you get the oil and, the, and, and this fine dust from the graphite mixing together and it starts to wear down the surface of the armature and it just becomes a big mess. So one drop of oil, a tiny, tiny drop of oil, and we'll get to the oil in, in, in the next slide momentarily. Also here you'll notice <clears throat> I, have, I have little arrows pointing to not the gear teeth here, but to the axle that's that the little part of the axle that you can see protruding out from the, uh, the, uh, the frame of the motor here, a tiny drop of oil there on either side there. Again, you just wanna put oil where there's gonna be speed, where there's gonna be rotation metal against metal. And you only have to do that. You don't have to do this once a week or once a month. You do this once every six months, if that. Uh, my, my, my mantra is if, if it's not squeaking, it doesn't need oil. And nine times out of 10, maybe even more frequently than that, all you really need, is, need to do is put it on the ends of the armature that's spinning, as I showed you before. As far as lubricants go, I like the Fowler oil. There's nothing wrong with the Markman oil. The problem with the Markman oil is <clears throat> that the, the tip on it is, is a very um, broad uh, dispenser, and you can't get 
a tiny, first of all, you can't get a very tiny drop out of it and you can't get it exactly where you want. So that's why I like this follower oil. It has a, uh, a very, very tiny needle point tip. Uh, you can get it into very fine places. You can dispense a tiny, tiny amount, which normally is all you really need. Uh, that's what I use for all the, the, the gears, like I showed you with the previous slide with the teeth. For worm gears, um, Mark has been using a lot more of those in the last, oh, 10, 15 years or so. They call them uh, the bell-shaped armatures is, is, is their nomenclature. But um, Z motors, uh, a lot of Z motors, uh, almost all the Z motors use this. Uh, for that, I use the, the Trix grease. It's, uh, it's a little heavier duty. And I have to tell you, I've been using the same two, and I've, I've serviced hundreds and hundreds of locomotives every year. I'm still using the same first, the first uh, bottle of this Fowler oil. Uh, it lasts, it'll last you for years and years and years. So uh, again, less is better when it comes to, to oiling your locomotives. Very briefly, some spare parts. Uh, there are tires, there are about five, four or five different sizes of tires. There are a variety of pickup shoes available. Um, on the left here, it's, it's hard to see. I tried to take a good picture, but uh, it didn't come out too well. These are those little sponges. They're very tiny. They're maybe, oh, an eighth of an inch by a quarter of an inch. And they, they crumple up into a little ball and just stuff them into that oil, that oil wick reservoir that I showed you before. But the, these are available as parts. And over here on the right side, you'll see this is a contact. Some of the very, very old Martin locomotives um, had the pickup shoes actually soldered to a tab that looks like this. And uh, you can't just replace the, the pickup shoe easily uh, because they didn't act, many of them didn't even have this piece here. Uh, so when you go to replace the pickup shoe, you need to insert this a uh, little, I call it a pickup shoe contact. But again, it's a part. And the nice thing about Mark locomotives, they, they could be 50, 60, 70 years old. Uh, all these types of parts, they're still readily available. Uh, other parts that uh, I just put these here because these have Markman part numbers for people who might need them. We have solder tabs. Uh, ESU makes some very, very nice thin gauge wire if you ever have to do repairs. Markman has various different uh, screws for different purposes for the, for the motor shields. Uh, this is a part here that uh, separates the smoke from the, from the headlight on steam locomotives. Again, I just put these here as a, just a, a kind of a catch-all for various parts. Uh, there are tools here. I'm not, no need to go into details, but these are the different tools that I use. I would like to point out the, about something about the Marklin tool set because uh, a lot of people say, oh, it's just Marklin trying to sell tools. Um, not exactly. Uh, if you notice on the right side of this little uh, kit here, there are some nut drivers. Then uh, you need these to take the, the bolts and the nuts off the side of the, the linkage rods for steam locomotives. You can get them from other manufacturers, but I noticed recently after buying some from another place that the walls on the, on the sides of the Markland tools are actually a little bit thinner. And you would say, well, that makes them weaker. Well, technically, yes, but then you don't need a whole lot of torque to, to, to unscrew these nuts and bolts. And the fact that these are thinner walled um, uh, nut drivers than what you might buy commercially allows you to get into the tight space between the nut and the, and the linkage rods um, uh, more, more easily uh, to, to remove the nut or the bolt in that case. So I, if you're going to do any maintenance on your steam locomotives, I think it's like a 20 or $25 set. I highly recommend going with the Markland tool set. If for nothing else, then those nut drivers there, uh, it really makes, uh, makes, makes the job easier. Um, something a customer pointed out to me, uh, which I, I bought recently, is this little blue uh, work pad, which I, I, I thought it was kind of goofy at first, but it's got lots of nice little places to put your tools and put screws. And along the right side here, a lot of these uh, little cubby holes here are actually magnetic. So I, you know how you, you take screws out to, to, to do something and all of a sudden you, you lose them or a tiny spring. If you put them right here, they're magnetic. And, uh, there's a magnetic holder here so they won't fall away. Uh, I, I can provide links to how, where to get these on, on Amazon. Down here is uh, something else that's really handy when you're trying to remove the body, uh, 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 the shell, body shell from a locomotive or passenger cars. 
you don't want to use a screwdriver because that's going to damage the plastic. These little things that are called spudgers, it's actually a kit that they make for taking apart or, or, or servicing cell phones. But believe me, it works really great on, on, on locomotives as well. Two more things I have to point out here. If you're on good terms with your dentist, uh, you will have no problem in having him just give you some of his used, hopefully cleaned tools. And these are great for picking out little pieces of dirt or fibers or hair from between gears uh, and, and getting into reach to reach into places that you couldn't get to any other way. So next time at your dentist, ask him if he's got any spare uh, uh, tools like this. I'm sure he'll be happy to get rid of them for you. And over here is my trusty piece of 600 wet dry sandpaper. And what do I use this for? I use this to clean the flat armatures from locomotives when I'm servicing them. I just poke the, uh, the, the end of the armature through the hole there and I just put a little pressure on the face of the, um, of the armature and it polishes up the copper perfectly. Uh, I'm sure you could use something a little finer than this, but I found that I've been using this same 600 piece of, uh, of wet dry sandpaper for many years and it, it really does a good job. It's not too abrasive and it, and it gets the dirt and it smooths the surface out very, very nicely. I know it sounds kind of weird, but it works. I can confirm that. I've seen that same piece of power, um, <coughs> sandpaper on his desk for easily two decades <laughs> now. Peter, this is your slide. Oh, sorry. Uh, you gotta have tools. So, um, I recommend three Phillips screwdrivers, uh, the uh, flat screwdrivers you see here, and the nut drivers. I also highly recommend the Marklin set because of what Robert said. If you've ever had to change tires on a steam locomotive, you will uh, appreciate the fact that the wall is, is uh, a lot thinner and can get to the nut where um, some of the thicker ones, you just go, how am I going to do this without bending something? I also recommend a pair of sharp point tweezers that you saw on the previous slide. Additionally, there's something that I use in the OR, not frequently, but sometimes, uh, it's called a brown Atson surgical tweezers. You can get those on eBay, and I think in the next slide, Robert has a picture of it. Um, I also like these micro brushes. They're, they're actual dental applicators, but you can find them on Amazon um, as, as little brushes. The silicone mat that Robert showed you there with the magnets, I use that, I love that. There's nothing like not losing a screw uh, to make your day go a lot smoother. I also like to have a little white rug, which started out as a bathroom rug that I cut up into quarters. Um, the nice thing about that is it won't mar up your locomotive, but it also has the added advantage if you do drop a tiny little part, it doesn't bounce across your desk and then bounce, then hit the floor. It will fall down and uh, it will typically stay in place. So you got a better chance of finding that tiny little screw. 70% uh, rubbing alcohol is used for cleaning of pickup shoes and, and wheels and so forth. It does not affect the tires. I have lighter fluid on this list because it in most cases, and this is not a promise, in most cases, it will not destroy paints or decals or such. And then I have uh, the flitz paste, which you might have heard of from my previous presentation. Uh, it will clean, it will um, take uh, oxidation off any kind of metal surface. I have a nine volt battery, which I will get into later. And I also highly recommend for your workbench, a decoder tester. Now, some people say, well, I could just stick it into another locomotive and you could, but the ESU decoder tester has so many different ways of attaching. On the one hand, you've got the, the eight pin, then you have the 21 pin, but you also have the, the, the US uh, standard. You can just stick wires in. Um, there are so many options and it just makes it it, it just makes your life easier if you have one of these. Next slide, please, Robert. Okay, uh, <clears throat> yeah, here's a picture of, uh, again, the tools, the battery, uh, Peter will get into that. Uh, I've got links here uh, for the various soldering irons. Uh, Peter can address that. I do wanna mention one thing about the Ronsonol lighter fluid. I actually, I know you're gonna think I'm crazy if you didn't already, but uh, I actually put the Ronson lighter fluid in an ultrasonic cleaner and I drop the 
locomotive motors in there and I let it go crazy for about five minutes, that gets every bit of dirt, dust, grease, everything off the locomotive. Of course, then you have to you need an air compressor to blow it all out. But if you want to get your motor nice and clean and get all the stuff out of it, um, this Ronsonol does does wonders and it doesn't leave any residue. And uh, like Peter said, and it's safe. I've never had a problem on any metals, plastics, any, any paint, anything, at least uh, from Markham's product line. If you want to talk about the soldering irons here or the tweezers, Peter. Yep, I will. I just wanted to mention, make sure that you light a cigarette while you're waiting for the ultrasound cleaner to <laughs> finish. <laughs> and uh, down at the bottom, you'll see the um, these brown Atson tissue uh, forceps. It's, it's really weird, but there's nothing like not having a screw rotate in your tweezers while you're trying to stick it in that hole down at the bottom of the locomotive. And that that pair of uh, tweezers will help. I also, uh, in previous presentations, had uh, recommendations for soldering irons that have variable temperature. And this is probably the most reliable solution for um, an economy-based um, uh, an economy based, based mind. Um, you can change the temperature and you can change the tips on this. They're about $100 a piece. Um, the, TS, uh, the TS100 has 65 watts, as you'll see in the bottom right corner. The one up at the top is a TS80, which I think has 49 watts or something like that. Yeah, that one. Um, both of them are are great solutions and I think um, more appropriate than a $500 soldering station. And you can and still the, have, yeah, sorry. I was gonna say in the middle here, we've got the, my, my old trusty standby. It's a 12 watt, believe it or not, it's a 12 watt Weller pencil soldering iron, which I used for many, many years. It takes a little while to heat up, but uh, if, you, if you're in a pinch, you want a spare and for under $50, I, I, I highly recommend it's a great soldering iron if you don't want to spend a lot of money. Let me just throw one more thing in. I think for maintenance, you're going to need a soldering iron. Not being able to solder um, makes your maintenance so much harder. You break off wires, trying not to disconnect them. Um, and then all of a sudden the wire is shorter. It, it, it's, it's more of a mess than just desoldering something and then resoldering it. You don't have to you don't have to turn it to Michelangelo with, or Michelangelo with a, with a soldering iron to do some basic repairs. Okay. Um, I have, uh, this is a slide from an earlier presentation, but there are a lot of re uh, additional resources available. Um, there were books, uh, there's a CD that Markman came out with, which uh, people need uh, diagrams and stuff I can help them with. I have downloaded hundreds, if not thousands of exploded views. Uh, so if anybody has any questions about what they need to do to service their locomotives or they need an exploded view of anything, I have, I have books, as you can see this one in the upper right, it, 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 this covers locomotives from 1953 to 1980. And, and, and since then, uh, there, I've, I've got lots of other publications and stuff. So if anybody needs any information, um, it is available. A lot of it's online. Markland's website has a lot of good information on, on the older locomotives. Not much going past, say, night earlier than 1980, uh, but I have I have pictures uh, that go back to the 1950s. So again, anybody needs any information, they're always welcome to just contact me, to um, uh, and I'll be happy to help them. Peter, your turn. Thank you very much, sir. So if you would kindly give me the next slide. Oops. <laughs> um, this is an overview of Robert's um, setup. He has a central switch that will switch any kind of um, controlling uh, unit to the track. And his track output is either a straight piece of track on his left. Uh, in the middle, he's got this rolling stand and he also has a, um, uh, a ESU look, to look tester. And in the interest of time, Robert, I'd like to move on, please. Uh, this is again a picture of Robert's uh, test test bench and you can you can see the controllers uh, over there and the list on your left. Next slide, please. Well, uh, let me let me address this just right. momentarily. Um, a lot of times people send me a locomotive and they, they say it doesn't work. 
And I said, well, what, what, what doesn't work? And they say, well, it, it just doesn't run. So what I do, my method for testing a locomotive, I always start out with the, the, what we call the, the lowest common denominator. I put it on my test track and I try and run it with, a tra with an old transformer here, old faithful here. Okay, because if it doesn't run an analog, that means there's something really, really seriously wrong with it. That means that either the pickup shoe is bad, it's not making contact with the motor or the decoder. So I always start out with analog. Then if it works with analog and it's digital, I then go to the 6021 here and I put it in address and I get it to run that way. Again, that way I know that at least the digital decoder is receiving a signal that's reacting to whatever number I punched in. If it's DCC, I've got an IntelliBox here and I'll, and I'll try it with that. And if all that works, then I will go to the mobile station and I'll try and get the locomotive to register uh, mobiles, but the mobile station is, or the central station. I think it's important for people to understand that if you have something that doesn't work, it really is worth the money to invest or keep one. It, does, it can be a 10 watt analog transformer, but uh, that's the first telltale sign. Does it have any life at all or not? Is to run it analog and then move move up to 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 the to the digital operation. I have found that time and time again to be a real uh, lifesaver when trying to diagnose pro problems. Okay, Peter. Thank you, Robert. Um, so, to find a problem, I've divided the um, the diagnostic steps into five groups. Um, first, power pickup. Second one is wiring. The third one is the decoder. Then down the line are the motor and the functions, which are lights and sound. Um, one of the first ones is, does the track have power? Don't laugh. It's, it's trivial, but often missed. I've had more than one uh, instance where people uh, thought just because their central station was on didn't, and they didn't have power. So some people put an illuminated passenger car on the track. Um, you can build a tester from a light bulb or a diode. Um, and last and least, Robert's favorite, but not mine, uh, short out the track with a screwdriver. You get a spark, you've got power. Then is the power getting to the reversing unit? So I'm now going to wiring. Is, it, uh, is the power getting to the reversing unit or uh, the pickup switch um, on, a, on a two rail um, or to the decoder? If, if, if you've got the right address, can you turn the lights on? Or if it's analog, do the lights come on? In that case, um, you've, you've got power probably to the reversing unit or decoder. Um, and then the question is, if none of that is true, do you have the right digital address? If it's DCC, you can check the CV1. If it's an old digital um, decoder from Marklin, you can look at that little uh, little little pads and decipher the, the positions and figure out what the address is. But sometimes you do have to, um, I, I've had it where uh, somebody sent me a locomotive and there were, it wasn't the, the factory address and I went through all 80 addresses to figure out how to get this thing to run. Um, then the next step is, does it run in both directions? On an analog locomotive, um, you can have a wire in, in, um, in a, I'm talking analog, uh, three rail and with a field coil. You can have a locomotive running in one direction, but not in the other. I stood at a dealer in, in New York City for probably 15 minutes while he was trying to figure out why the locomotive would only run in one direction and not in the other. And I, I offered my help and he said, Nah, thinking, what does this guy know? He's only a customer. So I just, I walked away. That could have helped him, but you know, can't help everybody. And then this is not so much for you, but for when you communicate to someone that can help you, um, the question is, can you rep reproduce the fault? And if you can, make a little note of it. Next slide, please. I'd like to highlight two things that you that you that you mentioned here. Uh, you might have glossed over them. That the fact that whether or not you can turn the lights on, that's that is key. I can't tell you how many times I'll get a locomotive that I can turn the lights on, which tells you right away that that's getting the it's it's recognizing the digital address. 
if it doesn't run, then you know right away there's something, there's an issue with the motor, but it's not with the pickup shoe, it's not power, it's not anything like that. So being able to turn the lights on is actually pretty, pretty important when you're trying to diagnose a problem. And the other thing is, uh, and Peter mentioned it, is about does the track have power? How many times do I ask a customer, does your track have power? Yes. And I say, how do you know? And I get silence. dead silence. I silence. get dead silence. So <laughs> that, that's why I like the screwdriver trick, because if you can short out the transformer and make a trip, yeah, then you had power. I, okay. Sounds kind of simple, but okay. Next. Um, I'll take this one, Peter, if that's okay. I, I, no, I, no, I, I need I, you to. Yep. Okay. I, I snuck this slide in uh, just, just yesterday. Uh, a lot of people, a lot of people have, um, uh, whoops. Okay. I'm back. A lot of people, uh, uh, they send me the locomotives and they say, well, how can I tell if it's a Delta locomotive? Well, it's easy. You can look at the item number. It begins with three, three something or three, four something. And it's got this little symbol here that Markman puts on all their locomotives. And if it is Delta, you need to know it, you can only run it in analog mode if all the switches are off, which is how they come from the factory. And you can only run in digital mode if you open it up and turn on some of the switches. Because if some of the switches are on, it will not run in analog mode. And if any of the switches are, uh, and if all the switches are off, it will not run in digital mode. It's important to know. And I included this table here with all the possible uh, addresses here for Delta locomotives for people to reference. And you'll see these, uh, these little arrows here with the question mark and that goes to this next slide. Uh, for many years, Markland put out locomotives with the first two digits with three, six. And these had FX decoders. And oftentimes people say, well, how do I know what the address is? I bought this on eBay or somebody gave it to me and I don't know what the address is. Well, Marklin uses the, these default addresses, 24 for electric, 72 for their diesel and 78 for steam. And you see below there it says, how do, how, do you, how do I know that? Because these are the same addresses that Marklin assigns by default to their diesel, steam and electric locomotives in this table. So that's how it's easy to remember. If you have this table here, you'll never uh, have to worry about trying to figure out what the address is, assuming nobody changed it. Because you, with the FX decoders, you don't know. There's no way you can't program them. There's nothing you can read from them. Uh, you have to go with what, uh, with what they were set for from the factory, unless somebody made a change to it, of course. Um, when it comes to MFX locomotives, I get a lot of questions like, oh, it won't get recognized. And I said, well, is it MFX? Or how can I tell? Okay, do I understand what MFX is? Uh, a lot of people think that they put the locomotive on the track, they've got a mobile station or a central station. They say, well, it didn't get recognized, so I tried the address, the Markland Motorola address. That will never, ever, ever work. If it's an MFX decoder it, and it's on and it's being controlled by a mobile station or a central station, the only way the only way it will run is when it gets recognized as an MFX decoder. You cannot use the Markman Motorola address. That's only reserved for other types of devices like the 6021 or any other controller that does not recognize MFX. And that's, that's an important concept. I know I'm going over it quickly because we don't have a lot of time here, but I'm happy to explain that further for anybody who would like to know. Okay, Peter. Okay. So, um, if the motor won't run, uh, will it at least hum? And um, a little footnote here, um, Robert's uh, uh, repair and maintenance goes towards the old Marklin motors. More and more Marklin motors are can motors or not the old disassemblable motors. But um, if it's an old type, will it hum? That tells you that the motor's getting power and there might be a mechanical problem. Um, the older the motor or the newer the motor, the less tolerate, tolerant it is to you letting it um, hum. Uh, you can burn out a motor fairly quick, a, a new type. So don't, don't let it hum too long. Um, That's for the can motors. Uh, yeah, not only. The, it depends on the, on the diameter of the, uh, of the wire that they, uh, that they uh, wind around the anchor. Um, so I'd like to mention three of Robert's patented tests. The first patented Robert Fronfeld test is 
to move the powered wheel. Um, very specifically, make sure you move the wheel that has the gear attached to it. Um, uh, sometimes you can actually destroy or at least get uh, a steam locomotive out of quarter if you use if you um, move the wrong one. Um, the things that you shouldn't turn the wheel on and force the motor to turn are mo um, locomotives with cannon shafts, worm gears, can motors, or belt drives. Belt drives are usually not used in Markland, but some of the Rocos have belt drives. Um, you should also not, you, if you have very strong hands, if you're used to, if you, if you uh, can move a, a locomotive with a, a, a prototypical motor locomotive with your hands, then no, you shouldn't try this. What you achieve here is that you're able to um, identify if there's a mechanical problem and the, and the motor won't turn the wheels or if you um, have a problem with the motor. Um, then the next one is the Pat and Robert Fronfeld squeak test. If it squeaks, it may need oil. If it doesn't squeak, leave it alone. Um, then the patented Robert Fronfeld sniff test. Robert claims that based on the smell, he can tell how much the loco has run. If it has been over oiled, that's an important one. Uh, when it was sold and how much warranty it has left. I've actually seen him do that. So um, he's pulling, he's thinking. pulling your leg. He's yeah, pulling no, your I'm leg. Not. Yeah, but no, um, seriously, you can you can you can smell it when 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 it's uh, when it when it doesn't have enough oil, especially the very old locomotives. They do they do emit a, a almost a, like a little burning odor that tells you right away they need a little bit of uh, attention. Next slide, please. Uh, pickup shoe tuning. Um, the pickup shoe has to be flat, absolutely flat. Uh, that will get you the best contact. Uh, I use a small piece of glass, but you can also use a, uh, a straight edge. You hold it up to the light and you let, um, you can see if any light comes through between your pickup shoe and your straight edge. If it does, bend it to uh, make no more light come through. But remember, it is a consumable uh, part, so don't spend too much time on it. It's, it's probably um, better to throw it out than spend a half an hour on a pickup shoe. Um, proper distance from railhead is important. You can bend the bronze springy material till the pickup shoe is perpendicular to the up and down axis of the, of the pickup shoe. You look down the long axis of the locomotive. You see if it's tilting to one side or the other, you can bend that. And then um, you also can bend it so that when you do push it up and down that it, that it goes up equally. Um, important to clean the surface of, an, of uh, a pickup shoe. I clean it with both uh, flitz paste and uh, isopropyl alcohol. Next slide, please. Um, the nine volt battery test. This is something that I highly recommend when you go to a trade show. Uh, you have a nine volt battery in your pocket. It works on analog and uh, digital locomotives. Most Marklin locomotives, except for the Delta locomotives that were just talked about, if they've been set to digital, they won't run with a battery. There are also some locomotives that I might not be aware of that you can destroy the decoder of, but they're not Marklin and they're not ESU decoders. You can uh, use it with any nine volt, uh, with any Z locomotive. Um, you can use it with every locomotive if you disconnect the decoder. Uh, it's one of my easiest tests to see if the motor's okay. Under 99% of the cases, if you can get the motor to run with a nine volt battery, it'll be fine. I have had some very few CAN motors that run with a nine volt battery but do not produce enough torque to run the locomotive. That's rare, but it does happen. Um, you can use a nine volt battery, even though it's DC on a field coiled uh, Marklin motor. Um, you just have to put it to the one terminal of the motor and to the one terminal of the field coil, and you will get that to turn to. Next slide, please. I think the important thing here to note is you really can't hurt anything with a nine volt battery because these things are designed to run off of much higher voltage, well, relatively higher voltage. So the nine volts will never, will never hurt anything. 
Oh, Peter. <laughs> All right. Uh, we'll just leave this slide up for a moment in the interest of time. I won't read it to you, otherwise uh, Dale might kill me. But um, I'm just going to read you the, uh, remember uh, Dave Letterman's top 10 ways to um, do this or that. I'll leave you, I'll leave you with, a, with a number one, um, top, top number one way to PO the repair guy. Uh, you did not buy the item um, there and expect a warranty, a free warranty repair, because sending it back to Germany would be too expensive. And uh, with that, I bid you good night. And, uh, and with that said, if somebody has a problem, I'm always here and happy to help them no matter where they got it or what the problem is. I have one and more that's disclaimer. The end. I have one more disclaimer. I do yes. not actually commercially repair locomotives. I do it for friends. So um, it does it for me too. Yeah, <laughs> and, and friends and Robert. Yes, I. I, I yeah. <laughs> all right. Sorry okay. for running over, guys. Okay, we're all done here. All right, guys. Back to you, you stretch. What, that's fine. You know what I think we're going to do? I was just uh, actually offline talking to Dale. I want to give him his due here, uh, and he does not is not going to have enough time to do his presentation. So. I'm gonna do a little uh, speaking about our 52nd uh, meeting coming up. I'm just gonna do a little reveal of that here in a moment. And then I think we'll open it back up to you guys for uh, Q and A on your presentation. Great, great and, idea, and, thank you. And That's then wonderful. both of you guys also need to send uh, Dale a, a bottle of wine because you ran over, okay? So that's, uh, that's, that's my rules, okay? Red or white, Dale. <laughs> All right. So with that, uh, Glenn, I'll tell you what, can you uh, run that little video? We've been kind of teasing about who's going to be our presenter and uh, this will tell you. Hello, my friends mm. from ETE. I'm looking forward to see you in April, April the 12th. And uh, I have to go up very early or I have to stay very long uh, for we meet us at two o'clock in the morning, my time. In America, it's about five o'clock in the afternoon. And I'm looking forward and I'm really happy that I can talk to you and I uh, tell you some things about Eisenbahn Romantic and some things about the wonderful hobby of model railroading. And I always say, Das war's von dieser Stelle aus. Bis denn und tschüss. And there you have it. There's our presenter. I've gotten a lot of comments here. Uh, uh, everybody seems to be very pleased with that. And I hope you are. Stretch, I'm disappointed. I was looking forward to the Pope. Well, <laughs> in damn close. I call, uh, I call Hagen the Mick Jagger of model railroading. And uh, he's a pretty good friend of mine. And I said, "Hey, I need you. I need you to be on our one-year anniversary. I think everybody will enjoy it." And he, he said he would. He's be quite the character. He is. I've had the pleasure of his company. I had lunch with him once. Uh, he's, yeah, yeah. He's, he's a hell of a nice guy. Yep. And I think we'll uh, we'll look forward to it. I think he's going to show us some content that hasn't been seen before, and we'll do some Q and A. So we'll be talking about the the structure of that meeting over the next couple of weeks. So. With that, again, uh, uh, for those of you who tuned in to see Dale, I apologize profusely because our two uh, other presenters did a great job, a wonderful presentation, but it did run a little long and that's just not fair to Dale. So I think we're going to reschedule him um, and he's okay with that. So uh, with that, I'm gonna open it up for uh, questions and answers. We've got another 12 minutes or so. We've got 160 people on, so please, everybody, don't speak at once. Be respectful wow. of other people. So if you've got a question, uh, unmute your mic and go ahead and ask these guys, and they'll do their best to address it. So uh, before, before we get started, I did see in the chat uh, section here that somebody asked, how do you know if it's an MFX locomotive? Uh, if, if you have the original box, it says so on the box. If you have the instructions, it says so on the instructions. If you don't have any of that, uh, if you just pop the top off, if you take the shell off the locomotive, if it's a 21 pin decoder, it's an MFX decoder, plain and simple. May I, uh, may I also touch on that? Yeah, um, what I do to figure out is I uh, put in the, either the road number uh, on Google or I go to, to eBay to see if I can find um, a model of that 
of that ilk. And then I, I try to figure out what the part number might be at Marklin and I go to Marklin's website. And, and you can look up the lo most locomotive. Actually, any MFX locomotive will be on Marklin's website. You can look it up by just putting the item number in the upper right-hand corner of Marklin's uh, uh, page there, and it'll come up and it'll show you and give you all the details. Well, what I meant was if I don't have the item number, I just have the right. road number or right. the, okay. or the, um, or the uh, uh, it found number of the locomotive. All right, questions for our guys. Who's got a question? Nobody? Um, Robert, uh, do you repair only Marilyn locomotives? Uh, primarily. Yes, but when I with and, and but when I get one that uh, looks like it's beyond my pay grade, I turn I turn it over to Peter. So if you want to send it to me, uh, I'm happy to look at it. And if uh, if we can't fix it, then it doesn't cost anything. We're happy to give it a try. The most Thank important you. thing is the most important thing is to to be able to identify uh, what's wrong with it. What what is it not doing or or what was it doing when it stopped? Uh, the more information you can provide is always uh, very helpful. Uh, same here. If anybody has a DC locomotive, Fleischmann or Woko, and has a problem, I can help. I've been doing that for about 50 years. So I would let to help people if they have a problem. I cannot guarantee that I can fix it, but I can at least see if I think it is fixable. Really, thank you very much. Great. Okay, um, I have... Uh, I have a couple of uh, terminal decoders that I suspect of uh, being sort of dead. Uh, is any of the decoder tester like ESU, uh, can they be used for a terminal decoder? No, the, really the only, the, the simple way to test a, a, a turnout decoder is really just to, is to you know, uh, you know, have it in the, in the turnout and see if it's working. The most important thing to do to, the easiest thing, uh, what I normally do is, uh, you want to make sure it's the decoder and not the motor. So what I typically do is if somebody says it's not working, I'll use the same motor with a new decoder, or I'll use the same decoder with a new motor. Mm -hmm. That way I can certainly identify, is it the decoder or the motor? Mm -hmm. That's, that's really the, the simplest way to make sure which, which item is not working uh, properly. No, I took one. I took one of the dead de probably dead decoders out from under the track and hooked it up to a brand new uh, motor that I just got out of the box, and it nothing, nothing goes. And it's, that is probably the decoder. Yeah, there's really nothing right. to, to test with it beyond that. Yeah. No, it's been. You can there. check if a if a decoder the, the actually produces an output voltage, at least with uh, an MRI accessory decoders. I had a couple of them in bed and I just simply use the voltmeter and see if I kind of oh, I call it a spark. Why would such a decoder die? They're just sitting there, it doesn't do anything, nothing's going on and one day it works and the next day it doesn't work anymore. That's the thing about electronics, sometimes that, that does happen. <laughs> Thank you. Are these slides oh, available uh, from the presentation somewhere? I beg your pardon. The the the, the images from the presentation. Oh, sure. I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna email my presentation. I'm, I'm gonna email the presentation uh, to uh, to Stretch, and he can he can make it public. Sure. Well, remember, remember, all of our presentations, including tonight, will are of course up on the uh, in the uh, members only area of our website for replay. So you can replay them and freeze them right. and so on. The slides are all there. Oh, they record these. I'm, I'm going to ask a question that I, I pretty much already know the answer to because I've done a lot of this type of work of what are the things that you suggest to never do uh, when troubleshooting? What, what do I suggest to not do? Right. Like, you know, you don't want to do like, you know, the 24 volt order instantly oh. because that will fry a decoder. Okay. Um, well the one, the one, the one thing that Peter uh, touched upon, uh, if you have a locomotive and and and, the mo and it's not working, and you know that it's not a can motor, you know it's just a regular Marklin, uh, you know, three pole or five pole motor, uh, you can try and force the wheels to 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 move just to see if there's any mechanical obstruction, and sometimes it's just 
nine times out of 10, it's just that the oil has, has hardened. It's, it's turned to glue and, and you just can't move it. Uh, so trying to move the wheels with your fingers is fine, but the one thing you do not want to do is move the wheel that does not have the gear on it because you will loosen it on the axle and it will never ever be the same again. So that's the one thing I would never do. Uh, other than that, Peter, can you think of something <laughs> to never do? Uh, the list is long, but um, <laughs> I was just thinking about something when you when you touched on gears. I've had uh, easily a dozen um, Z-scale locomotives where the gear surfaces were worn down because they ran them too long without oil. So in contradiction to what you said, I think a little bit of oil on the gear surface, and I mean a tiny, tiny, tiny amount, um, won't hurt. Oil. Um, so you also want to use grease on the worm gears, right? So oil oh, yeah. Is, uh, yep. right? That's, 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 that's the preferable uh, lubricant, absolutely. Actually, when you you'll, you notice, oftentimes, if you if you get to that point, if you take the uh, if you take the the body shell off of a Marco locomotive that's got a worm gear in it, there is a ton of uh, grease just just sitting there. It looks like it's just sitting there doing nothing, but it's 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 there, and it'll get it'll get used up over over time. But uh, definitely use the the Trix grease, uh, which I always have here. If anybody wants some, that's good stuff. Well, there's there's other Teflon greases and stuff as well. I just use the Trix grease because it's uh, uh, it's easy for me to get. And also, I, 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 uh, experience I too, you'd also want to uh, mix the Teflon grease with the oil because that can cause problems. All right. So I have I have something to say. So Robert, I cringed a little bit when I saw your. I no. I personally like. The old Lionel grease, you can find them on the shows. The, those grease from 1940 and 1950 are very much alike to the, uh, alive today. They don't get, they don't get hard and, and, and there's a ton of them around. Thanks, Paul, thanks for that. Uh, one thing I wanted to say, I don't know if you can see this, but this is, uh, a product that uh, Trix puts out, and it's actually a tester for um, the track itself. It'll also test uh, uh, Mark on AC as well, uh, by just putting it on one side of the rail. And, and Hawk makes one too, yep. They're, that's also out there, that's great. Yeah, great little testers. And uh, I also want to offer my uh, uh, expertise, anybody on the peninsula down in the Bay Area that needs any work or anything done, I'm always available um, as well. So, uh, Great, Ivan, thanks. Hey guys, I'll tell you what, I think we're going to wrap it up for tonight. I think uh, we've, uh, we've covered it all. I want to thank very much uh, Robert and uh, Peter for their presentation. And uh, I want to thank Dale for uh, under, being understanding and uh, allowing us to push this off. Thank you, Dale. No problem. Thank you. And guys, that's it. I'll see you next time. Uh, same bat time, same bat channel. See ya. Thanks, Rich. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, everybody.